All right, hello. Uh, my name is Bill Kazamchuk. Uh, I live in Levittown, which is about half an hour northeast of Philadelphia. I've got a suburban garden, about a quarter acre, 100 by 100 lot. And I grow a little over a thousand roses and I've been doing it since 1988. I uh, became a member of the ARS in 1996 and joined the Philadelphia Rose Society in 1997. So I've been doing this for a little while. Uh, some thank yous and some tips. Um, I think John and Mitchie Moe for the original presentation um, and Laura Dickinson who updated this a couple years back. Um, a lot of this program was taken off of there. And also I thank you the Consulting Rosarian Committee for the newest version of the CR manual. I use that for a lot of reference. Uh, it is used plain and simple slides. Um, if you're showing the control panel on your thing, um, if you want to minimize that, it'll give you a maximize your view of the presentation. And for the CR school candidates, keep an eye out for the check marks. That's going to be important stuff you want to pay attention to. Uh, foundation for any good garden is good garden soil. Uh, this is a picture of our garden. And when I started planting, I amended the, the beds pretty well, and the, the garden has grown quite well over the years. Uh, first topic, what soil does? Uh, it's a home for the plant, and it holds them in place. It also holds the nutrients to feed the plant. Uh, without nutrients, the plant's not going to grow well. It also stores water and air. Um, don't you think about air in the ground, but soil contains a lot of air, as well as the water. Provides a habitat for soil organisms that help break down nutrients to provide fertilization to the plant. And it also filters water. What is soil? Uh, Soil consists of four major components. You have your inorganic materials that comprise about 45% of it. You have organic materials, which compose about 5%. And then air and water each compose about 25%. Now this is on average, you get a heavy rain, you're gonna get a lot more water in the soil, less air. Um, if you have soil that doesn't drain, you'll have a higher percentage of water as opposed to the air, but ideally what you're looking for is a breakdown similar to this. Soil texture, um, the inorganic part of the soil determines its texture, it's combined of sand, silt, and clay. Uh, if you look on the chart, you can see a sand particle. We normally think of sand as small, but compared to the other two ingredients, uh, sand particles are the largest. They go from a 20th of a millimeter up to two millimeters in diameter. Silt is the medium sized particle. It's one 500th of a millimeter to one 20th of a millimeter up in diameter. And clay is the smallest particle, less than a, fifth, a 500th of a millimeter in diameter. I like this chart. Um, I've seen some other ones, but this one really kind of gives you a better idea of the size of it. Um, where you can see the size of the sand, the clay doesn't really even show up on there. Give you just an idea how small those particles are. Not wanting to advance. Okay, sorry about that. Didn't want to advance on me. Uh, this is soil texture chart. Um, it shows you the different 
types of soil um, according to the percentage of clay, the percentage of silt, and the percentage of sand. There's various different combinations. Um, obviously, the higher percentage of clay, you'll get more of a clay soil. If you have a very large percentage of silt or sand, you go to those corners, and then everywhere in between is a combination. Um, what we're looking for is a sandy loam, which is 60% sand, 20% silt, and 20% clay. That's the ideal soil for growing roses. We all don't have that. Um, we try to amend our soil the best we can to try to get to that in the end. As a very simple test for determining your soil texture, um, get a mason jar, mayonnaise jar, peanut butter jar, um, get a cup of soil, remove all the stones and organic material out of it. Uh, you put it in the jar, add a few drops of dish soap and fill it with water and you shake it well and then let the contents settle. It's going to take quite a while. Eventually, you'll see the sand will settle on the bottom, then you'll get the silt and then the clay at the top. And if you measure the height of each layer, you can determine the percentage of each one for your to see where your soil texture is made up of. Now, if you want to try to change soil texture, um, it's something that's not easily done or quickly done. The ideal properties of loam come from how the sand, soil, and clay particles have been together. A lot of it comes from years of weathering, stuff breaking down, chemical reactions, and interaction with living organisms in the soil. Um, if you, a lot of us are told if you did, you know, to dig a hole, amend the soil, and put it back in. But when you put the new moisture or the new mixture back in the ground surrounded by the old soil, you can get water stratification problems. The water and the roots don't want to move easily between that newly amended soil and the old soil. Um, where I live, we have the real thick, heavy yellow clay. Um, at one time it was farmland here, but when they built the development, they removed most of the good soil and I guess put a thin layer on top for the grass and so most of it subsoil is, is real heavy clay. When I first started planting roses, I dug a hole, like they said, and made a nice size hole. I mended the soil, put it back in. But over a few years after I started showing roses and changing some roses, whenever I dig an old rose out, the roots hadn't really grown a lot into surrounding soil, it, almost like they were planted in a clay pot. So. It kind of showed me if I want better roses and a better garden, I was going to have to do something more than just digging the hole and amending the soil. So I ended up from then on, I started amending the whole bed instead of just digging a hole and amending the, the soil for the rose. So the roses that were in, a lot of them I, I took out when they were dormant. I went through and I amended the whole bed and then replanted them. And the roses seemed to do a lot, lot better then. And now if I dig a rose up, it's the roots aren't just kind of stuck in a little clay pot anymore. They spread out and they, they grow into the surrounding area a lot better. So if you plan on trying to change the soil structure, best best to mend the whole bed or at least do a very large planting hole. Uh, one of our members in Philadelphia years ago was giving up roses because of his age and health problems. He couldn't do it. And we went out, he invited us out as a group to dig out the roses and bring home. Well, he had these huge, huge roses and we were wondering how we we're gonna dig them out. But the good thing was when he planted his roses, he made huge holes. Um, he said he could almost stand in them when he, he had dug them so big and amended them. So the roses really spread out and they really grew well. So he didn't have that problem as opposed to the little kind of small holes that I had planted in. So he basically had almost amended the whole bed, but he just did it in large, large sections. 
Um, in my garden, like I said, I had the heavy yellow clay. Um, I found lately that adding large amounts of sand has really loosened my structure up. But that was also with a large amount of compost, peat moss, gypsum, shredded leaves. So it wasn't just sand and the clay. I had a lot of organics in, and I tilled it all together really well. And the soil seems to stay a lot looser than it used to when I used to just amend it with the organics. Um, after a while, the organics kind of tend to get used up a little and the ground will kind of stiffen up again since I've been putting a lot of sand in it. It seems like the soil stays a lot looser. I can almost some of it go in and dig kind of with my hand, um, it stays that loose. But if you do sand and clay alone, as the CR manual says, it can give you cement. So you don't want to just do those two. Uh, the clay will fill in all the little areas between the sand pores and just give you a, a block of block of soil. Uh, gypsum is another thing that I've used um, lines to the clay cells and makes it a lot looser and it also helps to remove some of the sodium from soils with a lot of salts in. But the best way if you want to try to change your soil structure is to add a lot of organic material, um, improves drainage, has airspace between the clay and in sandy soils, it will also help you retain water. Kind of the opposite of what you're doing in the clay. The clay you want to drain better in sandy soils, you want to retain the moisture better. Uh, why soil texture matters? Um, one in for it's for water drainage. Um, you want water to pass through. You don't want roses to sit in wet soil. You also need air in the soil, so um, you don't want all the water to stay there. Um, the second part is water holding capacity. How much water stays in to be available? You'll want some of the water to stay, and if you have sandy soil, organics will help. You know hold a lot of that in so it makes it available and it doesn't just drain right through. And it also provides the airspace for the plant growth and metabolism. And as a rule, you know, most of you have heard roses don't like wet feet. Um, roses will take as much water as you give them, but they don't want to be sitting in standing water. Uh, my father had his roses planted in his vegetable garden along the edge and whenever he watered the vegetable garden they always got water so he always had a lot better roses than I had because mine kind of didn't get all that attention and didn't get all the water so his roses always did really well over there. This is a simple test to see what kind of drainage you have in your soil. Uh, if you get a coffee can cut off both ends push it down about an inch and moderately damp soil. Um, you don't want it bone dry and you don't want it soaking wet after rain. Uh, you fill the can with water and it should take about an hour for it to drain for the water to go down through. Um, if it drains quicker, you may want to add more organics to your soil to hold the water a little better. Um, if it's not draining, you have the problem with maybe a heavy clay. Um, you want to amend it to allow for better drainage so the roots aren't sitting in wet soil and rotting away. And then this is the opposite kind of um, testing your soil for, oil re or for water retention to see how well it holds it. Uh, if you get two quart containers, mark the one at 50 or 25, 50 and 75% levels. Um, fill the flower pot with about a gallon of soil set it on, on top of the jar, then you dump in your quart of water slowly and let it wet the soil and then come back in an hour, check your watch, come back in an hour and see how much water is drained out. Um, about half of it should drain out. Ideally, if your soil's good, you should retain about half of that water after an hour. Different types of to soil textures we've talked about already um, is sandy, 
is large particles, drains quickly, um, doesn't hold enough water for plants, so you need more frequent waterings. Um, where I live, it's pretty much clay, but I have friends that are half hour, 45 minutes away toward Jersey Shore that have sandy gardens and they have the problem, opposite problem, where the water drains too much. So they have to water a lot more often and you know try to try to add a lot more organics to it to, to hold the water better. Uh, clay is mostly small particles. You don't think of it as small particles because when you dig it, it comes up in lumps and chunks. But that's because the particles are so small they just bind together tightly. And the problem with having totally clay soil, it holds too much water, it doesn't drain, and it's poorly aerated, so the roses don't get the oxygen they need either. And loam is a mixture of small and large particles. It's well aerated and drains properly and keeps the right amount of water. So ideally what we're looking for growing roses is a rich sandy loam and the roses will perform their best. Now the organic material um, is the 5% of the pie chart you had seen. Um, it consists of living and dead organisms. Um, the dead or organism are made of decomposing organic material called humus, which produces humic acid. And that helps break down the inorganic materials and chemicals um, to make them available for the plants. Uh, creates soil aggregates called PEDs that help give the soil its structure. It increases water holding capacity in sandy soil and can also lower soil pH. Now the organic material, the living part, uh, is composed of a variety of groups. You have your bacteria, actinomycetes, which are, look like fungi or bacteria, fungi, algae, nematodes, anthropods, earthworms, and mammals. Um, and there's a relative chart of how many there are, you know, for a certain amount of soil. And the real small ones you get a lot more of. Benefits of the living organisms, um, there's several of them. They help till the soil to create air spaces, bring organics to the lower level soils, mixing soil components. Uh, they break down organic material into nutrients that the plants can use. And they help soil aggregates, ped, act, act like glue to hold the soil structure together. Now, if you want to add organic material um, when you're preparing for planting, uh, some of the things you can use aged manure. Best not to add fresh stuff if you're going to plant right away. Uh, can tend to be a little hot and burn burn the roots, the new root structure, the feeder roots on the roses. Um, compost, which is aged, mulch, peat, and earthworm castings. Um, when I've, like I said, I've done my beds, I use peat moss. I've used Shredded leaves is another one that's not listed, but um, I've even put them in before they've been fully composted just to add some more structure to the soil along with the compost. Um, also, if you have a place where you can get aged mushroom compost is a really good um, amendment. I've used that before. Um, stuff I've used that in has been some of my better performing beds as far as the, the plant growth. And the benefits of compost, compost improves both soil, both clay and sandy soil, um, gives you drainage in the clay, holds the moisture in the sandy, um, it lowers the pH of the alkaline soil if you, if you have that type of soil, uh, helps feed the microorganisms that facilitate the nutrient ability to the plants. Uh, releases slowly over time. It's not a fast acting, um, but over time it breaks down and gives more nutrients to the plant. Uh, can best be used as an annual top dressing. Uh, one of 
my friends that used to belong to the West Jersey Road Society had a uh, Thanksgiving compost party when his kids would come home from school or visiting after they were out of school. He always had a compost party at Thanksgiving time. They'd come over in the morning, he would get his load of compost, they would top dress the beds, and then they would come in when they were done, get cleaned up, and then they would have their turkey dinner. And his he had some really, really nice soil in his garden because it was an annual thing they did every year, and over time it just really, really filled up the soil and made it nice and loose and full of nutrients. And you can also mix compost in your planting hole, but you don't want to mix too much. Air, um, like I said, we don't always think of air in soil, but it's a big part of plant growth. Uh, it's important for photosynthesis, which produces carbohydrates and respiration, converts them for plant growth. Um, Soil should be about 25%. If we have that ideal soil, provide oxygen and carbon dioxide for the roots. Um, air is also essential for the, the living organisms, organisms in the soil. That way is to increase air supply and in heavy wet clay, um, adding organic material it helps break up the soil, uh, provides drainage, creates airspace. Uh, another way to do if you have really dense wet soil and clay, um, you can use plant the roses higher than the surrounding soil. You can mound the bed up, build a slightly raised bed, or even raise it higher if you have a problem with drainage. Um, you create channels in the garden to allow plant for the plants to allow water to drain away so they're not right up against the plants. Or if you really have a hard time with drainage in your garden, you can install a drain system along the base of the rose beds to help collect and drain the water away. Uh, water, roses need water to get to get which I get through the roots. Um, Plants are 50 to 90% water. So making sure you have sufficient water is critical. Um, major uses for water by the plant are its essential element for photosynthesis. Um, it's the process by which plants make food for themselves. It's also used in transpiration to cool the leaves. Um, I can really see this in my garden, not so much plants that are in the ground, but in potted roses in the summertime. Um, basically in the summer when it's hot, uh, the roses transpire so much water that on a hot 85, 90 degree day, the, when I come home from watering the plants the day before, a lot of time, the bigger roses that are in pots, uh, soil will be dried out even though I have extra trays underneath to keep extra water uh, on the really hot days, that water is just sucked up through the plant and given off through transpiration. So uh, it becomes when it's hot out, it's, it's a daily routine, even with the extra trays on the bottom to try to keep the roses wet. Uh, water is also used to transport nutrients and carbohydrates throughout the plant. And it makes the cell stiff or turgid so the plant can remain upright and also give rose petals or substance. Um, hot days, sometimes you can go out and the plants just look kind of limp. The leaves, the petals, they just don't look right. Um, if you give them a shot of water, a lot of times after a little time, you go back out and they, they seem to have parked up a lot. So you want to make sure your roses get plenty of water. Watering tips, um, they recommend one inch per week, more in the midsummer. Um, another one of my friends tried to figure it out. We always talked about an inch per week. So he kind of tried to figure it out. 
what is an inch a week? Well, he kind of tried to figure out mathematically by measuring the root zone, how far down the roots were, and for your basic hybrid T type rows, he's he come up with it averaged about two gallons um, to wet that root zone for for an inch of water in it. Um, so whenever he went out and he he did his watering, he would always try to he'd take a bucket, time see how long it took to get two gallons in the bucket, and then that would be the time he would spend on each rose when he was out watering. Try to give it that. Now, if you have rain and you have a rain gauge, you can check. Um, so if you get rain, you don't need to water as much. But if it's a dry week and you're not getting anything, that's kind of a good uh, basis to go by. Local water restrictions will guide you on your best practices. Um, a lot of communities now are suffering droughts, so there's restrictions on the water. Um, it's been quite a while since we've had any here, but probably been 10 years or more when we did have, they, you weren't allowed to water during the middle of the day. You had to water before a certain time or after a certain time. Um, some places may even be more restricted than that. So you have to kind of go by what you're allowed to do in your own community. Watering at the base of the plants better than overhead. Um, water deeply and infrequently to encourage deep root growth, minimize leaf wetness. If you go out and just sprinkle the plants every day, the roots are going to develop to that little, that very top of the soil to where it's getting the moisture and you're not going to want to develop down farther. So when you do, you want to water nice and deep. Um, spend a good amount on each rose, or if you have soaker hoses or irrigation, um, you want to let it run quite a while. Um, I have soaker hoses on a lot of my beds, so I'll run them for a certain amount of time and then go out and switch it to another area. When I do hand water, when it gets real dry, um, I try to get it really, really nice and wet and get that water to pass down you know just through the top of the soil down to, to lower in the, in the root zone water in the morning so the sun will quickly dry the leaves um, if you water in the evening the problem with that is going into the the night the leaves are wet uh, provides ideal conditions for fungus problems to occur so you don't want to overhead water in the evening. Um, another benefit I heard in the morning with watering was, since the fungus spores tend to develop overnight, if you're doing overhead watering in the morning, that tends to wash any of the spores that are germinating on top of the leaves off. So that's another benefit if you're going to overhead water and you do it early in the morning and then the roses will have plenty of time for the foliage to dry, you know, before nighttime. Diagnosing soil problems, um, right? And the CR manual tells you no consulting rosarian should recommend a soil change without learning results of a soil test. Soil chemistry is complex and it's easy to come to an improper diagnosis of the problem unless you have scientific data on the chemistry of the soil in question. So, someone's really having problems that seems to be in the soil first thing you would should really recommend is doing a soil test and they can see what they're dealing with um, professional soil testing laboratories or agricultural extensions give you the most accurate complete way to test the soil um, they test ph minor and major nutrients and organic matter um, it's funny, friends of us were telling years ago um, when Frank Bonadella was competing for the big national trophies, he was winning a lot of stuff. So his friends from New England came down and they wanted to, they took a soil test in Frank's garden to try to find out what he was doing or what was going on that he was, his roses looked so great. They come down, they took a some soil out of his garden they sent him to the laboratory and 
they said when the test come back, it said the soil is unfit for for growing roses. Uh, I guess there was so much of everything in it that it wasn't what they were looking for. But on the other hand, Frank would water so much that everything was so available that the roses were able to maximize the use of what was there. But as a lot of people know, exhibitors tend to go a little bit crazy and overboard with some other stuff. But it was just an amusing story that the soil tests come back that way. Um, a normal garden, you're going to get a soil test back and it'll tell you what deficiencies you have, what you need to add, or what you have too much of that you want to hold back on um, and not keep building that up. So it's a really good way to find out what's exactly going on with your soil. Um, another thing you can do by yourself is to test the soil pH. Um, the meter that's on the left-hand side was an inexpensive one I had got years ago at Home Depot. I think it cost me about $15. Um, it seemed to work okay. It probably wasn't totally the most accurate, but it gave me a really good idea. And the first time I used it, um, I went out and I found some of my garden areas were really, really low from so much fertilizer over the years. Um, and I couldn't understand why the roses weren't doing well. Some areas they were doing okay, but a lot of areas they were really, really struggling to grow. So that kind of, I thought, well, let me check. And that that proved because some areas were, you know, where you want between six and 6.5. I was getting some areas five and a half, five. Some areas were even down to 4.5. So they were super, super low on that. Kind of gave me an explanation right off the bat as to what was going on. Uh, the center picture and the left picture are, are a Kelway um, pH meter, which I got last year. Um, very easy to use, a lot more accurate, um, they're a little pricier than the other ones, but um, it's a good way to check your pH and kind of keep that under control. Now, soil pH we talk about is a measure of the hydrogen ion concentration. What that does, it determines your nutrient availability for the plant. Uh, pH of seven is neutral. Um, pure water is, has a pH of seven. If it's below seven, it's considered acidic. Uh, above seven, it's alkaline. Now, an interesting thing that I learned while putting this together was I may have known before, but forgot, but I don't remember hearing it. Um, each number on the pH chart is 10 times more acidic or basic than the one before it. So if you have a pH of seven is neutral, a pH of six is 10 times more acid, and a pH of five would be 100% more acid than a seven. So like I said, I had some areas that were 4.5, and that just shows you how much it was off. And if you went down to four, it would be a thousand times more acid than a pH of seven. So that's interesting fact to pay attention to. And like I said, it, I learned something putting this together. And as I had said, the roses do best in a slightly acidic soil of 6.0 to 6.5. And this is a pH chart that shows the nutrient availability um, in the soil. And as you can see on the chart from 6 to 6.5, if you go down through the chart, most of the minerals and Chemicals are in a good proportion. Um, as you go one way or the other, they can become a lot less available to the plant. So a highly acidic soil with a pH of around four, nitrogen, phosphorus, 
potassium, calcium, and many of the trace elements are tied up and completely unavailable. Now, if you have a pH of seven or above, then some of your metals, iron, copper, zinc, boron, manganese, become less available. So if you stay in that six to 6.5, you're kind of in the sweet spot. So extremes in the pH, soil pH, can affect the availability of nutrients to the plant. What pH is influenced by um, your native bedrock will determine what the pH is like in your soil. Also annual rainfall. Um, if you're in an area with high rainfall, the soil tends to be more acidic. Um, if you're in an area with low rainfall, your soil tends to be more alkaline. And also the history of your property, um, native versus developed agricultural pasture, age of your house, settlement of your land. Um, so my area was farmland before it was built back in the 50s. They developed um, the whole town. Um, so the pH was probably a lot different in the, the farmland and the native soil as opposed to what it was after they developed it. They took a lot of the top soil away. Um, so all that changes and if it's, you were built, your property was built on an agricultural area that was fertilized a lot, um, as opposed to just being a pasture where there was just not, not added fertilizer to. Um, it would also develop how the pH of your soil is. What can change pH? Um, your addition of organic material can change it inorganic or synthetic chemical fertilizers. Um, like I said, when I checked my pH in my garden and I had the areas that were really low, um, I used to fertilize really heavy with a lot of chemical fertilizers when I first started growing. Um, I've kind of moved away from that, went to more organics. So the changes in the soil and the pH aren't as bad. Um, but that can really drive it down. Um, spray material can also change it. Um, you spray a lot and the excess material can get on the ground and soak into the soil can also change it. Uh, rain can also change it. Um, rain is usually more acid now. And then constant use of city or well water could also order your pH depending what the pH of the water you're putting onto your garden is. So it's a good idea to keep keep up with and check your pH. And if you think, you know, if you use a lot, if you water a lot, also checking the pH of your water source will kind of give you an idea which way it's going to go up or down. And then test the soil periodically with the use of a, a soil test, and it will help determine which which way you need to go with adjusting it. How to keep your pH correct. Um, if your soil is acidic, you can add lime to increase the pH. I said I had numbers that were down, some of them four and a half, five, five and a half. And I limed heavily more so in the areas that were really low. And over time, it, it gradually increased. But it does take some time. Um, there's a fast acting lime you can use if it's really low and you want to try to get it up quicker. but I just used the regular stuff and it took a while, but eventually it all ended up coming up to where I wanted it to go. Um, use a soil test to determine the level of magnesium for the type of limestone you add. So when you get your soil test, if the magnesium level in your soil test says it's sufficient for what you're doing, then you use calcitic lime. If the magnesium is low, then you want to use the dolomitic lime, which will increase the magnesium in the soil. If your soil is alkaline, you can add compost, peat, organics to slightly lower the pH. Um, it's usually a slow and continuous process, something you probably have to do all the time if you have more alkaline soil. 
if it's really high and you want to try to lower it quicker, um, you can add sulfur to lower it, lower it quicker. Uh, tetanus. Um, tetanus is a, a, a bacteria that lives in the soil. Um, it's a cousin of the botulism organism. Um, and since we work in the soil all the time, um, there's thorns on our roses can cause breaks in your skin, um, scratches. We're vulnerable to the infection. Um, also, many of us use manure, which can also harbor the bacteria. So to be safe working in your garden, um, you really need to make sure your tetanus shot is up to date. Um, I just had mine this past summer. It had been about 10 years. I knew I was doing a doctor actually said on my chart, he said, you know, it's time for your tetanus. So, um, they recommend having a booster at least every 10 years. Um, one of our members in Philadelphia Rose Society was a doctor. He said he recommended a five year interval. Um, he said 10 at the most, but he recommended if you're working a lot and you have the, the thing, his recommendation was to go five, but you want to get it at least every 10 years. You want to be safe, don't want anybody having any major medical problems. And that's it. Any questions? Well, Bill, thanks for the great presentation on uh, soil and water. Uh, we're going to do a 30-minute uh, Q&A question and answer session. So if you have any questions at this time, uh, used uh, hand icon that's located in the control panel and unmute yourself and I'll mute you, unmute you and go ahead and ask your question. Hi, hi, Gary. We're actually going to go ahead and go into Diane's presentation. So if before we do the Q&A session, so sorry, everyone, the Q&A session will be had after both presentations. So um, I believe Ms. Eckley will be introducing Ms. Ms. Diane. Hi, uh, this is Mr. Eckley, but this is my... <laughs> Um, and uh, we're here today in the middle of a pandemic attending to a CR class. Um, this is the result of Diane being able to look at a problem and come up with a new solution. She sees problems as opportunities. Diane has many new exciting ideas for the future. I am proud to introduce Diane Summer, our president of the ARS. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, and I want to welcome everybody to this wonderful program today. You know, um, really, um, sorry about that. Okay, so uh, welcome again. And it's so special to have everyone here today and, and really to kick off our month long series on programs in honor of our consulting Rosarians. This is our third year, as, as I think Mike was referencing, of hosting online programs and our online uh, CR school. In fact, we started uh, by hosting a CR school um, in, back in 2020. And so whether you're here today just because you're not just, but because you're a candidate to become a consulting Rosarian, or if you're a, a consulting Rosarian and you're attending because you want to earn educational credits, or perhaps you're just a participant who's interested in learning more about roses. 
I know that you're going to enjoy the educational series that we have planned for the month of February. And as we, as we begin these programs um, in February, I just ask that you take the time to thank and recognize the consulting Rosarians that are in your local Rose Societies and your district. Uh, because really without our consulting Rosarians, it would be very difficult for us to carry on the overall mission of our organization. So with that, um, I'm going to start my program here. I've been asked to speak today about the, the consulting Rosarian ethics and what the CR program is really all about. In doing so, I wanna also recognize the American Rose Society for uh, 130 years of being in existence. Um, it's a, it's a wonderful milestone. It's very exciting to think that we've actually been here for 130 years sharing our love of roses. And you'll be hearing more about that throughout the year um, as we have activities planned. Our consulting Rosarians are truly the ambassadors and the representatives of the American Rose Society. Not only do they represent the American Rose Society in our interactions with the public, but they are also the key conduit for us to share educational information to all people that are interested in, in, in learning and growing more roses. So becoming a CR is not really um, a goal or an objective. Um, it's really just the beginning of a journey. And, and that journey starts with learning more and more, of course, about how to grow roses, and then helping others to grow roses. And as you're sharing that information, I, I, I really um, emphasize that you'll continue to learn more too. And it's, so it's a wonderful opportunity. I've been a consulting Rosarian for over 30 years now and, and truly enjoy that opportunity. On this page, you do see the consulting Rosarian code. And so I, I, you know, I've highlighted some important words here, but this is important for us to review whether we are um, planning to take the exam and become a consulting Rosarian at the end of the month or, or whether you're a consulting Rosarian today. Uh, you know, and I think about it as a judge, I'm a Horton and arrangement judge. Every year I start the year by going back and reading uh, the judging manuals just to remind myself of those key principles in judging. And I think we need to do the same when we look at our CR manual, because otherwise we tend to forget all the wonderful opportunities that are in front of us. So with the Consulting Rosarian Code, again, we are accepting the honor of the appointment as a Consulting Rosarian of the American Rose Society. We're pledging to, um, to provide opportunities to increase and stimulate membership in the American Rose Society in cooperation with our district director. You're upholding the standards of the American Rose Society in inspir inspiring a love and appreciation of roses, their culture and exhibition. You're promoting and forming new rose societies. You're securing new members. You're helping current members and anyone that's interested in roses. So this is truly, it's not just an honor, it's a commitment. Um, and it's something that we thank you very, very much for because without your role as a consulting Rosarian, um, it would be very difficult for us to further the mission of the American Rose Society as an educational organization. If perhaps you're on, on the call and you are a member of a local Rose Society, um, maybe you're a president of a local Rose Society, I also encourage you to lean on your consulting Rosarians because they really should be able to help you in, in your efforts within your local Rose Society. So let's talk about that a little bit. The consulting Rosarian role um, is, is really quite diverse in our local Rose Societies, but basically you should be available to participate in every aspect of the local Rose Society. You share your information, your knowledge with individuals that are asking for it, but it's not just waiting on the sidelines and waiting to be asked. Be proactive in supporting your local row society. Be available for members 
for your neighbors, for your friends, and for the general public. And volunteer to help wherever and whenever needed. Hold an office in your uh, local row society. Head up a committee. Uh, perform other tasks in support of committees. And you can see this wonderful little picture here on the right hand side. I actually snapped this off of Facebook. And you know, the thing that, uh, that really stands out to me here is yes, these consulting Rosarians are going to be doing a great program on pruning. Um, but look at how much fun they seem to be having. They're all smiling, they all look friendly. Who wouldn't want to attend an event like this? This is how you start to encourage participation from those in the community. And it's really how you can support and grow your local rose society. And be helpful to that new rose garden. Keep it simple. If you have a, a new rose gardener and they're asking basic questions, you want to make it easy for them to enjoy their roses. You don't want, if they ask for a, uh, maybe a selection of roses for their garden, you want to make sure you give them roses that are going to be successful in their garden, right? You might want to help with some planting and pruning hands-on type of activity. Potentially, you might be visiting their garden so that you can provide them some advice with a course, again, without being critical. You don't want to scare them away. You want this to be an opportunity for them to begin to enjoy the roses in their garden. By the way, I understand in talking with Baldo that this was a very successful uh, workshop that they held and uh, they had many, many people at it. So again, an opportunity such as this helps support our local rose societies, helps grow the local rose societies and is, is really critical that our CR step up in performing things like this. What about in your garden? Consulting Rosarians should grow a variety of roses. They want, should be able to, you know, be able to talk about how to grow a climber versus how to grow a shrub versus how to grow um, a hybrid tea. They should know about roses that do well in your climate. And they should be maybe even growing some of the more popular and newer varieties of the area. We want our CRs to stay um, informed as to what's happening in the world of rose culture and consider some of those practices in your own garden. So you have, again, some experience to share with others. You should be knowledgeable about the use of chemicals, including state and local regulations, proper application and safety protocols. You should be knowledgeable and supportive about alternative pest control methods, especially those that are non-toxic. And you should welcome visitors uh, to your garden. And of course, when you do that, they should see a wonderful display of roses. I should mention that as you're growing different varieties, it's not that you have to grow hundreds and hundreds of roses, but you should have experience in, in multiple varieties, be it you know, hybrid teas and miniatures and climbers and shrubs and floribundas, et cetera. So again, that you have that experience that you can share with others, depending upon their interest in, in growing roses. What are the requirements to remain an active CR? Well, certainly you need to have an active membership in um, the American Rose Society, as well as in, our local, in a local rose society. You need to exhibit a willingness to share knowledge and enthusiasm for the rose, both at the local Rose Society level and the American Rose Society. You need to uh, attend a CR school like we're having this month of February um, or earn four continuing education credits every four years. And one of those credits must be on chemical safety. You should allow that your name and your contact information is available. We can't consult and help others if people don't know how to get in touch with us. And you should complete a CR activity report to the district CR chair if, if applicable. It is expected, but it is not required that our consulting Rosarians participate in the annual Roses in Review program. And it is, is against the principles of the consulting Rosarian program to charge a fee. Sometimes um, consulting Rosarians are offered an honorarium to cover some of their costs. 
and certainly that could be accepted or uh, better yet it could be donated to the local rose society the education endowment trust of the american rose society uh, to the annual fund of the of the american rose society wherever uh, you feel is best suited Now let's talk a little bit about the consulting Rosarian role with the American Rose Society. And we're gonna see that it's very consistent with what we've been speaking about already. It's again, assisting members and non-members with questions and problems that they might have related to Rose care and Rose culture. Um, there is uh, the opportunity for our consulting Rosarians to help in grow in um, obtaining new members for the American Rose Society and also working together in organizing and supporting new Rose Societies. You should be um, encouraging your society to sponsor at least one Rose show per year. And at, you should be attending those local Rose shows and answering questions from the public. Our local Rose shows are a key opportunity for us to spread the interest and the joy of growing roses. So even if you care not to exhibit, and I know many don't, it is an opportunity to support the local Rose Society in putting on one of those events, you know, helping with, you know, putting up all of the tables, et cetera, or in takedown. But what, what's really critical is that you're there when the public is there and that you can help them answer the questions that they're gonna have on roses. And that's how you can participate and support your local Rose Society. Many of our districts have CR meetings at the district meetings, and you, you should attend those meetings if you at all can. Um, you should make sure that ARS membership material is available at local and district events. And again, you should have that willingness to share knowledge and enthusiasms for the joy of growing roses. You, you also have the opportunity to participate in the Speakers Bureau program of the American Rose Society, which enables um, us to provide virtual programming to societies across the country. So the American Rose Society has a commitment to our consulting Rosarians as well. We provide an infrastructure that supports Rose education and the consulting Rosarian program. We have our National Consulting Rosarian Chair. You've heard from Mike Eckley today. He and Anita, his wife, are our national chairs. We have District Consulting Rosarian Chairs. And we also, uh, uh, from a best practice perspective, I would highly recommend uh, that you have local Rose Society Chairs. We do provide educational content, information, programs, in support of Rose culture to help you continue to learn about, uh, about roses. We have webinars like today's, the American Rose. We have programs at our national and our district meetings. We have the Consulting Rosarian Handbook. We have a network of consulting Rosarians to learn from. There are approximately a thousand consulting Rosarians across the country and this program is one of the oldest. It's been um, in existence for about 100 years. We also have PowerPoint programs on rose.org under resources. So as you are preparing a program for, uh, maybe it's for your local Rose Society, or your district, those are resources that are also available to you. I do want to take a moment to really thank the National Consulting Rosarian Chairs, Mike and Anita Eckley. They're, they're new in their role, they're learning quickly, and I'm really encouraged by a lot of their thoughts and ideas. Uh, we also have the District Consulting Rosarian Chairs, and I've listed them here for you as well, in case you're not sure who your district um, chair is. The people on this page have already stepped up and have volunteered to help all of us learn more about roses. And I truly thank them for that uh, commitment. And I know they're gonna do a super job and uh, learn a lot from them over the next three years. And I'm just gonna end with a picture of the American Rose Center. 
uh, this was actually taken, I think, just a few weeks ago, but honestly, it's probably old because the garden is changing almost every day at this point. We are wrapping up the uh, Great Garden Restoration Project in 2022. And you can see here that we have all the concrete poured except in this fourth circle that's at the bottom of the page. And that's actually in progress at this point in time. Uh, we're working on uh, the plans to fill the third and fourth circle with soil and with roses as we speak. And I look forward to seeing the garden this spring, which when I'm sure it's going to be an absolutely beautiful bloom. And that ends the formal part of my program. And so with that, I want to um, turn this back. I can figure out how to do that. And Kim and Gary, I think we're now ready for questions. All right, I see Margaret Anderson, you have a question. Uh, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, very good presentation, uh, both Bill and Diane on the CRs. I grow a lot of my tender roses in pots. I live at the lake, um, the tip of, uh, the southernmost southwestern tip of Lake Superior in Superior, Wisconsin. And because I grow so many roses in pots, what what information could you give me on keeping my pH consistent um, other than keep testing the soil? Because I find I can put two of the same roses in two pots, two different pots, and one will thrive and one will not. So what can I do to make it consistent? And thank you. I don't know that it's so much the pH being different in the pots. Um, the only way you would really know is to test it. Um, but uh, a friend of mine from up in New England, um, getting brain freeze. He uh, he used to buy three of a uh, three of a kind when he got his new roses, and he said they none of they never really ever performed the same. Sometimes two would grow well, one wouldn't. Um, sometimes one would grow well, the other two wouldn't. Um, it was Clarence Rhodes, and he he did it as, as an experiment. Um, but he said it was very rare that he would ever get all three grow the same. So depending on how the roses were, you know, what bud would they use to to graft them, or what the root stock was like, they didn't always perform the same. Even if the same, you know, they were the same cultivars, you would get three three bushes, plant them all in one pot. So they were even planted together, you know, similar soil. And he said it was very rare that all three would perform the same. There was always usually one of one or two would do well and the other one wouldn't. So um, I don't know that it's so much what you're doing with them or the pH of the thing. I think it's probably just a difference in the rose plants. Sure, understand. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, Melody Dutch, I see you've got your hand up. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Bill. Um, guys, I hurt my back a couple of years ago and could not really keep up with my garden. So when I went out there, and I do have the professional pH uh, meter, I found that some of my roses were extremely low on pH. And I know there's the fast acting lime and there's the lime and all yeah. of this, but you know, I was sitting here going, wow, they are really struggling. How can I get the pH up quickly? And one of the things that I did, which I would not recommend to somebody asking me because it's not proven, was I talked to some chemist friends of mine and they basically said you could put some potassium bicarbonate in there if you dilute it properly. Uh -huh. So I wanted to know what your thought on that was and if you had a, another thought. They're, they're getting up there, but again, it's just been a struggle to try to get them back. Yeah, if you have chemist friends, I would, <laughs> I would, I would go with their thoughts more than mine, but uh, since they have the background in it, but like I said, I had, spots that you know i was shocked when i was seeing five and a half and then five and i had some that were down to four and a half and it took quite a while um 
for them to come back, you know, probably over a couple of years before it got back up to where I wanted. So it, it is a, you know, a process. And I've never personally used the fast act, acting line. Um, and I don't really know of anyone that has, but if you're looking for a little quick results, um, that could be the way you want to go or try the, you know, what your chemist friends had recommended. I uh, said so they would, having the background in chemistry, they, they would, you know, they would know. I guess if you would use too much, that, that may be the, uh, the thing that they're, they're a little wary of. But yeah, I, we used one tablespoon and two gallons, and that actually okay. over a few weeks brought it up one point. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I was amazed when I looked at that pH, you know, I saw the thing on the pH chart about, I thought it, you know, they, basically it was a constant difference between the things, but like I said, the way it says it's each number is 10 times more than the other. So if you're going two numbers, that's a hundred times the difference of what a seven to a five is or a four to a six. So um, that explains why it takes so long. Now it's, it, it doesn't seem to take as long to drive it down when you're doing a lot of fertilizer and spraying and stuff. It seems like it drops quicker, but um, to raise it up is a, is a process. Um, and that's something I, I probably need to do a little better job of here. Um, but when I had the issue, I, I could really notice the plants in the garden just seemed to be struggling and I, I couldn't understand why. Um, I've been doing the same things, you know, year after year and they look good the year before and then all of a sudden it just seemed like a lot of them just were in a sudden decline and I, I couldn't understand why. The weather hadn't really been different. I you know, didn't do anything with the thing. So I, I ended up getting the pH meter and I was just shocked, you know, how low some of them were. So. Yeah, yeah, and that's what happened. The whole garden didn't go down. It was just pieces, yeah. and yeah. you know the fast acting line, not so fast acting, guys. Um, okay. At least not fast enough because my roses were in distress. So I guess what I'm going to continue to do. Let me know your thoughts. Is I'm going to keep using the line, but when it, when I find one of those 3.5s, because that's really low, uh, I'm going to just use this tablespoon of this bicarbonate and try to at least get it up to you know like four and a yeah. half where they can get some nutrition it's just amazing like i said the, you know the difference in how quick it was um from the year before just and like i said you could just see you know and it wasn't in all the areas some areas were fairly close some were you know six or a little above six but other ones just and it wasn't the distances weren't all that far apart i could go 10 foot and it might be six in one spot and it could be four and a half ten feet away so um whether it was just a really just when i fertilized some got you know more more fertilizer than others over time and it or just maybe the way the water runs through the garden it just some areas leach out more i don't i wasn't really sure but it uh, it is kind of crazy how how much that does affect you know your garden and, and this the way the roses look. Okay, well, thank you so much. I just wanted to run those thoughts by and and I'll keep the program and see how it works. Yeah, and it'd, it'd be nice to to know how it works for you. You could post it somewhere or let somebody know. Robbie Ridenauer, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Oh, I can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, I had a question about um, when you live in a, a an area that has very hot summers. Uh, I like to cool my roses down later in the afternoon, but hopefully a couple of hours before sunset. Is there any harm in doing that? I mean, as far as fungal and those kind no, of there things. Shouldn't be. I, I've, I've actually done that when we've had some really hot weather, just went out in the afternoon and just kind of drenched the whole garden and the roses seem to really respond 
you know, you can, they just kind of, you know, the leaves and stuff just kind of look limp. And then after doing that, they seem to really perk up. And if it's that hot of a day, within half an hour, most of those rose leaves are going to be dried back off again. Um, so it's not like they're going to be damp going into the evening. But I, I personally think it, it makes them a lot happier bushes when you can do that. So yeah. I would recommend that really hot days. A um, friend of mine here was talking to me saying about how hot it was and he was watering his roses twice a day. He's one of the guys that grows these big gorgeous hybrid teas and he's got very large bushes and he was talking about you know watering twice a day and I kind of chuckled. And <laughs> he says well what's so funny? He says how often do you water? I said well I think I've watered two or three times this summer <laughs> because I've got so many roses it would cost me a fortune to try to get out and water every day plus the time and he's like really but my well, hybrid teas really don't look anything like his hybrid teas you know he, he's got these big giant bushes very healthy and um, I, I grow all different kinds and I kind of don't really pamper them um, some I probably really should more, but I don't. Here. So, and, and that, so I think four four in the afternoon, five in the afternoon, it really peaks, and yeah. I feel so sorry for the drooping roses. Yeah. And and I can like I said, I, I've done it before. You know, when we've had really really, and it's been dry before that. And since I don't water a lot, you know, mine tend 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 to show the uh, the signs of distress a little easier. So. Yeah, I, I would recommend that it's, you know, roses, as long as you have good drain soil, they'll take all the water you give them. And if you can wet the foliage down and it parks them back up, I think they would enjoy that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Debbie Brown, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Unmute. Are you there, Debbie? Oh, thank you. There um, you go. Uh, uh, in slide two of um, Bill's presentation, um, he had the percentage of sand silt and lime uh, for each. Could you could you repeat that, please? Uh, With you in a second. I'm trying to hold up here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a uh, ideal is sandy loam is sixty percent sand, twenty percent silt, and twenty percent clay for the soil right, texture. Thank you. You're welcome. Carol Wade, I see your hand up. Go ahead, ask your question, unmute. Are you there, Carol? You'll have to unmute, Carol. Okay, I finally got it. Okay. Uh, Bill, uh, after you add your lime to your, your around your bush, whether do you, first of all, do you uh, sprinkle it and, and scratch it in and water it, or do you make like the other uh, lady had said in a, uh, dissolve it in water and, and pour it around your bush? And my next question is, when would you recheck your pH? 
Uh, when I put it down, I had uh, I had just broadcast it on top. I ended up using the, the pelletized stuff, and I had just broadcast it, and I broadcast it on top of the mulch, and then I had watered it in some. Um, I didn't bother scratching it in. Like I said, it's a long process. It takes a while, so um, I knew eventually it was going to get there, so I didn't... Uh, I didn't bother scratching in or anything. I just let it go. And I probably probably waited a month or two before I rechecked it to see if the errors were going up. Um, it does take a while. Um, probably the best time for adjusting is probably the fall um, for areas that don't have actively growing. Um, if you check it then, you know, it has all winter to kind of break down and but you can do it any time of the year, but I think the majority of people probably like to check it and do it, you know, do it in the fall and, you know, over the winter when the roses kind of aren't actively growing that way, it's ready for the spring when they, you know, are ready to take off again. So. Thank you. You can check it as quick as you want, but it's it's gonna take a while. So I don't know that you're gonna see a big result if you check it a week later or so probably. I would wait a month or two and check it again. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Nancy Shu, I see you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Thank you. Bill, uh, I'm from BC, Vancouver Island, Canada, where we have more deers than roses. <laughs> I only realized that after I moved here one year ago and we bought a property without proper deer fences. So for now, oh. my roses will all have to go in large container, ten, containers uh, up on the deck, which I have uh, many. They are all 15 gallons. My question is, how do I achieve a good mix for growing different roses in containers? And this includes some old garden roses. In terms of the percentage of the compost, potting mix, which is mostly peat, perlite, vermiculite, etc. I know it would be very hard to achieve 60% sand, 20% yeah. silt, 20% clay in container. A local farmer here recommended that I plant my roses in containers filled with 100% organic compost. Would you do that? Why or why not? Thank you. I don't. I haven't really grown any long term in uh, pods. Usually, ones I have in pots are newer roses that I'm growing for a while till they get some size, or stuff that I dig out, um, kind of heal over in the in the pots for a while to kind of let them perk up, put back. Um, I've seen different things. People use different mixes. I've seen things where people would use a third of their native soil, a third of a potting mix, and then some other amendments with that. Um, probably the, the best thing would be to talk in some someone in your area, uh, maybe in your local district or local society that does grow them that way and see how things work for them. Like I said. When I when I pot them up, I I use smaller pots. I haven't grown anything in a big container. Uh, mine are usually in three gallon pots or smaller than that. And I you know I use a pure potting mix um, when I do mine, but they're not basically being grown um, in that for a long time. It's basically for the year I get them, or you know if I in between if I dig something out and maybe put it in a pot and then put it back in the ground in the fall. So um, I don't know if Diane might have any thoughts on that. Yeah, um, uh, what, I, what I've done is actually it's a mix and I would use like about 50% that's a soilless garden soil, if you will, garden mix. Uh, and then along with that, about a 50% that's going to be a good uh, garden soil from the, from the, from the nursery. Um, typically, 
if you just take the soil out of your garden, and maybe it's because my garden soil isn't as good as Bill's, but it's going to be too dense um, to really grow roses well in the container. So we tend to mix in a soilless mix uh, to support that better. Um, that's what we've done. And I've had roses growing in containers for several years that way. And would you put on a percentage of compost in it, or would you use 100% organic compost to grow roses in? Yeah, I don't think I'd use 100% organic compost, but I do think that you can add compost. You know, mm -hmm. what I would do is I would mix it all together outside. You know, if, you, if it's in a pile, um, I use actually a big tub, if you will, and I, I'll mix up the soil that way, and then I'll distribute it into my pot. So certainly compost will help. Thank you so much. Thank You're you, welcome. Bill, too. You're welcome. Hey, G, Mel D, I see you have a question. Go ahead, unmute. Hello, and thank you for putting on the program today. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I'm in the Seattle area, and I'm wondering if you could speak to the issue of uh, crown gall on roses. I've had some issues in the past with it. Um, I haven't had any in a long, long time. Um, I've also had some luck with removing it. Um, some people will say just get rid of it. It's got crown gall, but I've, if it's a really severe case, I would, I would get rid of the plant. Um, I haven't had a whole lot of issue with it in, a, in quite a while. It seemed like years ago I had a little bit more, and it wasn't, wasn't a lot. You know, maybe one percent of my bushes may have had some sign of it. Um, I think the recommendation is, if you do have a big problem with it, people will dig out the soil from the bed and replace it. I've seen some cases where um, public gardens or even private gardens have had really bad issues with it, and uh, you know the whole bed would get infected, but. I've never had that issue. I don't know whether Diane's ever had a deal with it much. Um, I've had some of that in my garden and actually in my old garden more than my current one. But uh, like Bill, I would try to cut it out when you see it. Obviously, the crown gall could you know, be in various locations on your plant, right? And so some is going to be more severe perhaps than others. Uh, but it, I think over time, uh, I have always seen that it weakens the plant. So you might uh, want to try even taking it and putting it in a pot or whatever as you are doing your surgery on your plant, if, if that's the case, if, it's, um, if you've got a lot of problems with it and trying to nurture it back to health that way. And I agree on pulling out some of the soil around that plant. It seems to help um, minimize repeat uh, occurrences of the crown gall. I see just in the kind of minor research that I've done, I haven't really found anything that addresses it from a chemical standpoint. Have, have you heard of any chemicals that could be used? Um, I have not, and I think that you really need to, to remove the gall from the plant. Mm -hmm. it, it's not something that you would use a chemical on. I've not heard of using chemical on crown gall either. I see. Never heard that. Okay. I think I've seen where they've fumigated beds with really severe infestations. Um, not sure what they use, but I kind of remember hearing that places that have had really, really bad infestations. Um, like I said, I've never experienced or heard, you know, anybody that I know had any real bad and, you know, it's usually one here, one there. I have to, I have found that it's very contagious already, so. It's, it's kind of spread a little bit, but uh, anyway, thank, thank you for your information and for your seminar today. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Sorry to hear that. Like I said, it's, you know, mine's been really isolated, so. I see. Um, yeah, we should actually make a note on that and then we can try to follow up and see um, if there's, if other uh, consulting Rosarians have options uh, to treat crown gall or perhaps there's one on this call that might know. Shovel pruning work. Yeah, I see. yeah. <laughs> I've seen that, and I've I've also seen where people have removed it, and then I think they've soaked the plant in bleach, 
after they've done their surgery on it. And uh, like I said, usually if I, if it's a little gall or if it's in one isolated spot, I'll try to remove it and see how it does. And as Diane said, a lot of times um, I may stick it in a pot also. And then the next year when I go to replant it again, I'll check it out and make sure it hasn't spread on anything. And, and most of the time there's no reoccurrence um, every once in a while it may come back and then I would just get rid of it. But um, a lot of times I seem to have been able to save, save the plant, you know, it seemed to have done fine after that. Sometimes you also get it on the roots too. It'll, it may develop on one of the root, you know, you see root galls and cut them off and never seem to come back again, so. All right, well, Adrian Rodriguez adds, adds up. Go ahead and unmute Adrian and ask your question. Uh, how's everybody doing today? Thank you for this uh, opportunity and uh, thank you for providing it via a webinar. It, it really does maximize a large amount of us who would like to participate to actually uh, be able to. Um, I have a bit of an off topic question, but it's something that I've seen come up a few times on the internet and I've never been able to get a 100% answer. Um, and it has to do with horse manure or maybe cow manure. Uh, and manure in general. Uh, would you recommend using manure, mixing it into your soil for uh, new roses, uh, newly planted roses? I guess it would depend if it's well composted or not. Um, if it's fresh manure, um, I wouldn't want to plant it with new roses because it could burn the roots. Um, if it's well composted, I might add it, but I I wouldn't add large amounts of it. Um, a lot of people use it as top dressing, uh, but as far as planting it in with the new roses, I would be a little hesitant about putting too much if it's you know if it's not really well composted. Yeah, I, I mean, on on one side you'll t you'll see it burns the you know the roots, and then on the other one they're like just throw it on there, nothing's gonna happen, and that's it, it's been confusing. Well, I think if you're top dressing, just putting it on top, you don't have to worry as much. Um, if you're gonna mix it in with the the planting soil, then you may have a little more issue. Um, <laughs> when I first got my First bunch of roses, I put about six or eight roses in the, the yard and my dad always had eight or 10 from my mom. So I, when I bought my house, I went out and I bought half a dozen roses. I put a lot, <laughs> a lot of fertilizer in the hole, mixed it in with the soil. I watered them really well and they looked great for about three weeks and then they all turned black and brown. And uh, I didn't know what I did wrong. So I bought a book and the books that don't put any nitrogen fertilizer in it. So I found out what I was doing wrong. And then uh, I saw so many different roses I liked. Next year I had more and I joined the American Rose Society and I started doing better. And now I've got a thousand roses, but that was uh, my experience with, you know, burning roots on roses. So um, manure wouldn't be quite as caustic, I guess, as a chemical fertilizer, but if you put too much in and those new feeder roots are developing, you kind of develop the same type of problem. But as far as top dressing with it, I don't think you would have any issue there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Looks like we got time for a couple more, so we'll go ahead. Betty Witt, you're all right. Go ahead, unmute. Well, Betty, are you there? We need you to unmute so you can ask your questions. Yeah. Getting a little short on time, so I'm going to move on. Peggy Lossberg, you have a question. Go ahead. 
Hi there, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, Bill, I'm in the same boat as you. I have really heavy clay soil. I've used up all my all my beds in my yard and I'm looking to expand. I know the more I can take out of that that garbage clay, the better. I also am in a city lot with no real access to a bobcat in the middle of Minneapolis that okay. can just trundle in and do that much as I would like. Um, knowing I knowing the more I take out, the better. What do you think is a, a good amount for excavating in like an urban lot? I know I'm, I'm going to try to go down at least a foot, but I'd love your opinion on how you would create a new bed, um, particularly in a kind of smaller space. Um, what you might amend with, etc. Thank you. Well, when I when I do a new bed, and it's been <laughs> it's been a while now. My wife says if I get any more bed, she's going to kill me. So. Um, but the last one I did, I, I probably dug it down probably 18, 20 inches. Um, I didn't really get rid of any of the, the clay soil, um, but what I did, I, I hand dug it all first with the shovel and um, I would till in, I think I started with the peat and moss first, and then I had a lot of shredded leaves I tilled in and then, uh, gypsum and limestone I tilled those in and then I ended up I I ha added a lot of sand to it I probably put three or four inches of sand on top of it and then uh, tilled that in really well and with the organics and the sand that you know the bed really did well um, but in your case if you if you do actually want to remove some um, and then replace it if you dig out that first foot of soil, I would try to dig down another 10 or 12 inches into the soil that you're leaving the clay. And then when you put your amendments in, I would add them gradually and then uh, try to till them into the this clay that you are leaving and then keep adding stuff and build it up. Because as I said in the presentation, um, when you have different types of soil, water and roots don't always want to readily move from that nice loose soil that you're developing into the old stuff so um, you want to kind of even if it's a transition if you dig down another foot and try to amend that some um, and even if you put a lot of new stuff on top better topsoil or amended soil it'll still have the ability to go into that other area of soil rather than just you know, have a basically a bathtub, you know, called a bathtub effect, where you, if you dug a foot out and then just put all your amended soil on top of it, it's going to be like growing in a giant, you know, clay pot. So I would probably try to do that, you know, dig out what you want to remove and then dig down maybe another foot or so and amend that as you build back up to where, you know, you want the soil beds to be. Very good. Uh, thank you so much. That's that's helpful. I'll, uh, I'll take all your good wishes as I start in the as I start that process. So I appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Well, that's our sure time. You're welcome. It'll, it'll be a little process. <laughs> uh, if you didn't get a chance, and I see several hands still up to ask questions, go ahead and ask your question in the chat, and somebody will get back to the question and send you an email response. Uh, thanks for coming and attending this uh, Consulting Rosarian session. Uh, the video will be up on the uh, American Rose Society website, rose.org, and there will be a copy on the YouTube channel. And be sure to check the calendar for upcoming uh, events. There'll be a session every Saturday this month. Thank you, Gary. This is Diane again, and um, I, I should introduce Gary to you. Gary's a volunteer as well, and he's volunteered to help the staff out uh, as we put on webinars. So this is Gary's first, um, first uh, weekend, if you will, helping us in hosting our webinars and helping Kim out. So. Thank you very much, Gary, for volunteering to help the American Rose Society. 
Um, and we do hope that you'll all join us next next weekend as well for our next session. Hopefully, I enjoyed oh, thank it. Thank you, Gary. First time I was trying to click on the link that Kim sent me, it wouldn't let me in. I tried several <laughs> times, wouldn't let me in. So I went to the reminder that John sent. Unfortunately, it doesn't have all the attributes I needed. So I had to get back out and come back in. So hopefully next weekend, it'll be a little quicker. <laughs> yeah, it's a learning process for all of us. Um, and the only way you learn is if you, if you, you know, do it. So um, thank you for taking that step. Okay, everyone have a wonderful weekend. Um, again, ask your questions in the chat session. We'll be distributing uh, the responses to your questions uh, after we, um, in the next week as we pull, pull all those questions together. So thanks again and have a wonderful weekend. And thank your CRs. <laughs> thank you all.